Hi there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mr. Schwenk. Welcome to Cleo's Corner Geography. On today's episode, we're going to investigate the European colonization of Africa, or what we also call the scramble for Africa. European nations have been the greatest colonizers of other land in history. Starting with the great voyages of discovery, Europeans certainly had a talent for arriving in places like North and South America, India, Asia, Australia, and Africa, and being able to militarily or economically dominate the local residents. The United States itself is a legacy of, of European colonialization, so it's difficult to say that it's all bad, but that view is certainly dependent upon the perspective. Colonization seems a whole lot better to the colonizers than the colonized. Just ask Native Americans, the Aztec, the Incans, the Chinese, the Australian Aborigines, um, the Africans, I think you get the idea. In our previous episode, we focused on the achievements of Native Africans and highlighted how Africans were very capable of creating long-lasting, complex civilizations that participated as equals in world affairs. Africa was a land with thriving kingdoms, but the Songhai had opened the door to trade with Europe via the slave trade, so pretty much anyone who knows anything knows that Africa is about to get taken over by Europe. The, the notion that, uh, that Africans uh, were were less than human, they were simple or stupid or savages in need of civilization, was a direct result of European imperialism and colonization, and unfortunately that still persists today for some people. It doesn't matter if you are talking about international affairs, wars, or even personal conflicts. An odd thing that you'll notice is that before before conflict happens, the participants will start generally by talking down to each other. This is not so much to make the other person feel bad or get in their head, uh, as it is really to help you dehumanize your opponent and make you feel that you're not hurting another human being, you're hurting something less than human, something that deserves to be hurt. You see it in war all the time, posters that make the enemy look savage or scary. If you thought of them just as people with sons and daughters and wives, husbands, moms and dads who love them back home, it would be difficult to pull the trigger, literally, and cause them harm. Instead, you have to demonize them. Um, you know, by the way, too, you also see this in video games as well. In a lot of shooter games, the enemy is non-human. Uh, maybe they're an alien or a monster. Um, if the enemy is a person, typically they have a backstory of why you're shooting at them. And if you notice, they tend to have masks on. It's easier to dehumanize something if you can't see facial features. But I digress. If European nations were going to invade another land and occupy it, take the resources of the people who lived there and force them to work for you, the first step is to dehumanize them and convince your population that what you're doing is okay. It's even better if you can get your people to believe that what you're doing is actually helping the people that you are enslaving, like bringing them civilization or religion. So our big idea for today is that Africa is going to be completely colonized by European nations that do not treat African people with dignity or respect. All right, so to get us started today, we need to identify that there are three major reasons that Europeans felt that they needed to create colonies in Africa. Keep in mind that a colony is a piece of land with resources that are valuable to the parent country. Colonies exist as a place for those resources to be controlled. If you rely on trade for your resources um, and, and rely on trade to provide you with the strategic resources that you need, then the trade partner could raise the price or even refuse to sell it to you. But if you move in, you take the resources, then you don't have to pay anything. 
So there are some pretty serious economic reasons, political reasons, and cultural reasons for European nations to spread their influence into Africa. Without exception, the major reason to develop colonies was economic. It started with the African slave trade. Spanish and Portuguese plantations in the Americas had started by enslaving the local native populations on the Caribbean islands, but without any resistance to European diseases, most of them died rather quickly. Without a stable source of labor, these poor Spanish conquistadores, who just wanted to run hugely profitable farms on the backs of overworked slaves, faced financial ruin thanks to natives for not having simple things like disease resistance to smallpox and malaria. The question became, where can we find large numbers of non-white, and most importantly non-Christian people, who are accustomed to working in hot climates? Non-Christian was important because in 1493, Pope Alexander VI issued the Papal Bull, or Decree Inter Satera, in which he authorized Spain and Portugal to colonize the Americas and its native populations, to colonize uh, convert and enslave. It also justifies, justifies the enslavement of Africans, saying, And we make a point and depute you and your said heirs and successors, lords over them with full and free power, authority, and jurisdiction of every kind. However, about 50 years later, Pope Paul III clarified in the papal bull uh, Sublimus du uh, uh, Dius that. Indians of the West and the South, under the pretext that they are lacking the Catholic faith, reduced them to slavery, treating them with afflictions they would scarcely use with brute animals. Paul states that the practice of this form of slavery was unheard of until now, and there was no morally justifiable reason for it. The second part of Sublime God instructed that any natives who shall hereafter come into the knowledge of Christianity should not be deprived of their liberty and, or of their possessions. Basically, Paul is saying that once someone becomes Christian, they can no longer be a slave. Europeans had to find non-Christians to enslave, and Africa was the perfect solution. The total number varies, but it is estimated that somewhere between 12 to 20 million Africans were enslaved and shipped to the Americas over a span of 400 years. This was devastating to African society. The people who are being taken are young, healthy adults who should be having children and working in Africa. What remained in Africa were the very young and the very old, which stresses that fabric of family structure and it destabilizes African economics, uh, economies and governments. The removal of so many Africans may, made it that much more difficult for a pre-industrial society to resist industrial Europeans when they decide to simply move in and colonize directly. To that point, Europe itself was starting to rely more and more on mechanical solutions and the factory system that we call the Industrial Revolution. Industrial nations require great amounts of mineral resources like oil and copper and coal, iron, rubber. Africa had all these resources, and it seemed to European nations worthwhile to simply move in and colonize. Many colonies, especially the British colonies, were very focused on resource gathering and trade. Unlike the American colonies, the Afri most African colonies were not places where Europeans themselves immigrated to live. There were some notable exceptions, especially in South Africa and to a lesser degree, Kenya, Uganda, Botswana, a few others. But the main goal was to turn Africans into large scale resource gathering factories rather than living space for Europeans. Connected to the economic reasons are the political reasons. Pre-modern Europe of the 1800s was still driven by royal heads of state, many of which were related to each other, especially after uh, Britain's Queen Victoria and all of her children and grandchildren that were married to various heads of uh, state around Europe. So uh, Victoria's granddaughter was the Tsarina of the uh, Russian Empire, 
who was actually related to her husband, the Tsar, uh, who was cousins with King Wilhelm of Germany, and uh, Wilhelm was cousins with uh, Victoria. So they were all sort of related, much like you might have some si little sibling rivalry in your family, the European heads of state saw Collins in Africa as a status symbol. The, the more you had, the more prestigious you were in the eyes of Europe's other kings and queens. An ABC book for young children simultaneously taught children their letters, indoctrinated them to believe that colony building was good, and instilled a solid sense of nationalism. When, for the letter C, the authors chose C is for colonies. Rightly, we boast that of all the great nations, Great Britain has the most. Um, I also would say probably with the presence of the kangaroo in the picture, then the, um, the uh, person of color there is probably an Australian aborigine. Uh, but it does not, uh, doesn't really change the fact that um, she's on her knees and holding a sun umbrella over the, uh, the white man so that he can eat his, his lunch comfortably. That's just so um, um, uh, horribly dated. At any rate, um, this did, however, lead to some conflict. The Dutch colonists in South Africa, called the Boers, fought a series of wars, uh, creatively called the Boer Wars, with the British, who wanted the strategic point in South Africa for their own. So there was some conflict between Europeans over the land, but the real event that brought home the understanding of how dangerous African colonies could be to the stability of Europe itself has to be the Fashoda incident. Now, both Britain and France have been creating colonies and trade routes in Africa for some time uh, before this. The French were trying to create a east-west trade route that connected their colonies in West Africa to their colony of Djibouti in the east, while the British, meanwhile, were committed to a north-south trade route between Egypt and South Africa. Obviously, these two trade routes would intersect, and both of them could not exist. Only one could. It was noted by both uh, countries that the most reasonable crossing of the Nile River was outside a small Sudanese village of Fashoda. Now, Fashoda, even today, is little more than a collection of some mud huts, a couple of trees, and I don't know, some goats. The, the value of Fashoda was in its location, not its resources. Both a troop of French and a troop of British soldiers both took off to claim Fashoda for their respective countries. When the two armed parties arrived at nearly the same time, a bit of a standoff took place with the French watching the British on one side and the British eyeing the French on the other. Meanwhile, the Africans are caught in the middle, hoping not to be blasted to smithereens, and the goats were up in a tree like, bah! Now, while there wasn't really a threat of violence on the ground, back in Europe it turned into something of a war scare, with both sides not sure if the competing claims to land could turn into a war between Britain and France. This would have been a horrible time for war. We were on the verge of, of uh, World War I in a few years, and you know this could have possibly radically changed the outcome of the entire 20th century. Luckily, things were smoothed out, war was averted. However, it was recognized that as European nations continued to expand their colonies, more incidences like this were bound to happen. Eventually, there would be war. To avert that, a conference of European leaders was called in Berlin to kind of rationally divide up claims to Africa. And I am oversimplifying it, but I mean, imagine a bunch of old white dudes standing around a map of Africa claiming territories like they were starting a game of risk. Notice no Africans were invited to the conference, just European nations dividing up a land that they hadn't even conquered yet. The result was a map of Africa that went from small coastal colonies in 1880 to the nearly complete colonization of Africa by the outbreak of World War I in 1914. The result was astounding, and it is the climax of European disregard for African sovereignty and culture. Africans are just background scenery in their own land. 
which was being stripped of its resources by European colonists. So as more and more Europeans were being exposed to Africa, there was a greater need to justify how and why colonies were needed and what responsibility European nations had to the natives that were living there. The dehumanizing of Africans, especially early on with the slave trade, had been extremely effective and successful in creating a very unique picture of Africa in the minds of Europeans, much to the effect of causing Europeans to see average Africans as savages in need of someone, that would be the Europeans, to come and explain for them how civilization worked. Never mind all the great buildings and art and those massive pyramid things that have been there since before the Europeans had writing, everyone knows Africans are not capable of taking care of themselves, or so the Europeans thought. Part of the European educational theory at the time was what we called the blank slate theory. Basically, it says that when children are born, their minds are just a blank slate ready to be filled with information. That information could either be good practices or bad practices, which would then influence how you would turn out as an adult. So if you've ever wondered why if you see old movies or pictures and you see small children dressed up like just like little adults, that's kind of why. Uh, you start, what you would do is you would start treating children like little miniature adults very early on to fill up that slate with the kinds of characteristics you wanted to see your child have in the future as an adult. So if it was good enough for European kids, it worked for Africans too. Some European nations saw it as their mission to civilize Africans, especially the French. The problem as they saw it was that Africans had simply been allowed to grow up without any direction. It wasn't the Africans fault that they ran around half naked, had overly exuberant dances or ate strange foods. It was just up to Europeans to teach them better. So wearing four layers of wool clothes in England to satisfy some Victorian era ideal of moral behavior might be fine for the, for the Englishmen. Unfortunately, it's not really appropriate for tropical Africa. You're going to die of heat exhaustion. There's a reason why African clothing and food and culture develop differently from European culture. It just doesn't work to try to force it, force your culture onto other people's cultures. But Europeans certainly tried, though. In line with popular ideas of racial superiority called social Darwinism, Europeans went to Africa to start schools and churches and provide social services for Africans. Schools were particularly bad. Often, African youth were forced away from their families to attend residential schools, meaning that after classes, the students were sent basically to dormitories or barracks to eat and sleep. The children would not be allowed to return home. They were forced to learn the colonial language and even renamed sometimes uh, from their, their ethnic African given name to a traditional European Christian name. Let me be absolutely clear. Religious missionary work is important still to Africa and many other parts of the world. Perhaps your church does missionary work. Maybe you or someone you know has gone on a mission trip. Today's missionary work is very different from missionary work in the 1800s. Today's mission trips are set up between two groups of people that want the assistance. In the 1800s, missionaries were used to, to force religious conversion and cultural integration. I, I love this image of, of the priest with his hand resting atop the, um, the, the small African boy as though he uh, um, is, is a, a domesticated animal or something. Um, they would sometimes gain the trust of a local leader only to advise them to give up control to the colonial authorities. It was a destructive and harmful relationship in, in many cases. Colonialization has had many effects and impacts on Africa, very few of them positive. As we've already mentioned, the slave trade depopulated Africa to the point that African society nearly collapses. In order to locate new opportunities for resources and colonization, 
geographic societies are formed in order to explore the interior of Africa. It was exceedingly dangerous for Europeans to travel in Africa due to diseases like malaria and yellow fever and sleeping sickness that were very deadly to Europeans. So to compensate, explorers would employ hundreds of African porters to carry all of their supplies and goods. So while Europeans like to focus on this romantic vision of an intrepid European explorer taming the African wild wilderness in his khakis and tall boots and pith helmet and gun, the, the reality was more like, you know, him and the hundreds of Africans carrying all of his stuff, including like fine tables and chairs and cast iron bathtubs. Uh, you had to travel across Africa in style. It was like the 1800s version of glamping. Sometimes it included actually carrying the explorer himself, because why not? Um, the Wild geographic societies expanded the world's scientific knowledge of Africa. It did so at the cost of increasing African exploitation, to the point of seeing 98% of Africa being colonized and conquered by European nations. It's worthwhile to mention that African tribes did not just accept European domination. Some nations fought back successfully. King Menelik in Ethiopia trounced an Italian army so harshly that it was able to secure its independence. No other European um, uh, power w w even tried to, to um, uh, invade Ethiopia. The British did for a short period of time, but that's a little bit of a different story. Most of the time, you know, in areas that were taken over and colonized, African leaders were actually allowed to retain their titles and rule as long as they understood who was really in charge. The alternative was to fight, but that never really worked out too well for the Africans just because of the extreme um, technological superiority of the, the now fully industrialized uh, Europeans. The result is that Europeans systematically exterminated African culture as they tried to enculturate Africans into their culture. African culture was based on oral traditions and stories passed down from generation to generation. When these young people are taken as slaves, these, the stories wind up being lost as the older generation passes away. African historians and advisors were called griots, and, and typically as a griot aged, they would take on a younger apprentice to pass down those stories. But with the, the uh, population gap, a lot of these griots wind up dying off before they have a chance to pass on the, the, the cultural identity of the African society. And so the deeper understandings of African ways of life are just lost, period. They're, they're, that's it. There's no recovering that document because uh, it's not. It's a document in their head. So people who lose their understanding of history often lose the ability to effectively handle issues. And that just makes conflicts worse. When European nations do decide to sort of abandon Africa, um, they, they do so extremely quickly and without considering cultural impacts. And so the modern uh, boundaries of, of Africa today reflect very closely the boundaries of the colonial empires. But those boundaries didn't always match up with the tribal boundaries um, that were that were part of Africa. And so you can see in this map, the, the blue lines are the modern national boundaries, but the tribal boundaries are marked out in red. Not all of these tribes liked each other. The way that Europeans would keep in control is that they would play the, 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 the tribes off against one another. And so in every situation, in every country, you would have um, 
one group that sort of collaborated with these people and another group or more than one group that would, um, uh, you know, wind up um, suffering at the hands of the Europeans. A great example is in Rwanda, where you have these these two tribes, the, the Hutu and the Tutsi, that um, the Tutsi were used as uh, sort of the people in charge, uh, and the Hutu were were essentially enslaved. However, when the when the Belgians give Rwanda its independence, they leave the Hutu in charge. And now they then want to take revenge on the Tutsi. And so, you know, Africa is left poor and stripped of resources and, and just sort of a patchwork of cultural traits. I mean, uh, this is, a, this is an, a, a, a complete society which has been traumatized um, and left with nothing. And so, you know, you push these ra these rival tribes together, and that breeds ethnic conflict, and and that's where really kind of where we're going um, uh, next week in our next episode is uh, looking at the legacy of African imperialism and how the Africa is recovering, but it's recovering slowly from uh, exactly this imperial. Um, uh, time period. So, you know, just to kind of cycle back to our big idea for the day, you know, European nations, they need these resources to fuel the industrial revolution. Um, but, but they fell back on biases and prejudices about Africa and Africans to justify going further than just international trade. If, if Europe had traded with African nations for these resources, you would have seen a, a very different Africa develop through the 17, 18, and 1900s uh, because they would have uh, participated in that world trade. Instead, the result was the marginalization of the African people and uh, the continent of Africa, and, and or rather seeing the continent of Africa really just as undeveloped land and resources open for the grabbing. It was that inability to recognize that the culture of Africa and the culture of others that fueled the fires of imperialism. The end result was the near destruction of African culture and the continuing and enduring challenge of, of success in African countries. In our final Africa episode, we'll take a look at the fallout from imperialism, how African nations have struggled and succeeded in some cases in their recovery. Uh, thanks for joining us today. See you next week on Clear's Corner.